Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Westfield Promise. This is Bob coming at you. Today we're going to be talking about Melance, Eric Melance, that is, and his analysis of the political economies of South, A- South Asia and Europe compared. So we're going to be looking at this. Uh, this is the final chapter of the origins of capitalism and the rise of the West that we'll be looking at in this unit. Um, and I want to dive in to our discussion in just a moment. A couple of things I wanted to mention about the previous chapter we looked at, um, comparing the political economies of pre-modern China and Europe. Um, one of the questions that kind of got posed was, why are we going all the way back to the Song Dynasty when we talk about China? This seems like a huge like long you know time ago like why why are we going all the way back to the 10th century and bringing it up into the modern period well that's really the crux of what melance is talking about when he asks that question why not china right if china is so developed for such a long time if those commercial connections within the south china sea that are connected to the indian ocean Right, which is connected to the African trade networks, which is connected to the Near East trade networks. If all of that interconnection is going on for so long and developing and continuing to become more sophisticated in its use of currency and its understanding of credit um, uh, investment and all of those different kinds of tools of commerce, why doesn't capitalism develop there? Right. If China had been insulated, if China had been isolationist, if China had been closed off from the rest of the world for that period of time, then one would could imagine, okay, then this makes sense. It's very clear. They could have potentially done this if they had been more commercial, but they weren't. So but that's not the case. They are incredibly commercially active. Um, even when the states, uh, uh, the you know, the emerging dynasties attempt to restrict it or slow it down. They're continuing to be commercial um, in spite of the law, you know, what we call smuggling. So this question of the Chinese uh, lack of development of a capital system really uh, is begged by the length of their commercial development and the degree to which they're developing all of these tools of commerce. So why don't capitalists become the most powerful class, take over the state as they do in Europe in the uh, 16th and 17th century? Why don't they transform the entire political um, edifice of the imperial court to serve their interests? What is holding them back? And to answer that question, we have to go back to Wallerstein, right? Because Wallerstein talks about this. He says, look, if you have a coherent political entity that rules over your world system, right, your economics order, that coherent political entity will act as a vacuum for capital. As capital is produced, it gets sucked up into the maw of the empire. And capitalists rather than seeing themselves as a distinct class of people with their own interests and their own um, in, in their own uh, uh, aspirations as capitalists, they see themselves as ambitious people, social climbers who are looking to the next rung on the ladder. And commercial activity is a conduit to that position, into the hierarchy of the nobility, into the hierarchy of the imperial bureaucracy, into the hierarchy of the court, right? They're looking at merchant as a position or merchant as a a job as a stepping stone, right? So you could have a Chinese family that potentially would go from um, well-to-do peasant to small merchant to large merchant to member of the imperial court within say five generations that that's not unheard of right it's rare it's very difficult to do there's lots of landmines that you have to traverse between you know peasant and noble 
but it's possible. And so the merchant class sees itself as um, ambitious for station within the imperial structure. This is also true of the Romans. We go all the way back to the Roman Empire. Same kind of situation. This is true of the Ottoman Empire, which is the uh, empire that the that the Turkish people, the Turkish Ottomans, rule over in the Near East. Merchant is not an end goal. It's a way. It's a means of getting up into the landed nobility, where the real power is. Right. There is no upper empire. There is no larger political edifice that European capitalists would seek to be ambitiously trying to get into, right? So they kind of get to this position of power, look around, realize they're actually more powerful than the landed nobility that's around them. They're more powerful in some cases if you're one of the upper level capitalists like the Fugger family or the de Medici's. They're more powerful than the kings even. So if you're more powerful than the king, why are you trying to get into the, why are you, you know what I mean? Like you're not going to step down in power, right? If you're ambitious, you're going to take over the state. So if we're looking at capitalists as a class, right, this class of people who take money in, transform it into capital investment to make more money, right, those people begin to identify themselves beginning in the 16th century as a distinct class of people from the nobility and having their own interests other than the nobility. There are vestiges of the the kind of feudal orders that last, I mean, well into the 19th century. I mean, hell, we still have some of them. Um, the, there's still uh, knights and, in, in, you know, people are still knighted in England. Um, we still have orders of knights in, you know, different European countries like Denmark. But the reality is, like, capitalists don't really care. I mean, that's just like a little bit of a, oh, that's nice. And that starts to happen almost immediately, right, in Europe. Capitalists, almost as soon as they begin to flex this kind of power, nobility is no longer an ambition. Nobility is just like, yeah, it's a nice thing to hang on the wall, right? In places like France, where feudalism is at its most powerful, even there, capitalists who purchase noble title did so as a means to legitimate themselves within the political order of France, largely to get themselves excluded from being taxed. But they don't go around wearing swords and pretending like their father fought on a battlefield with some ancient French king, Charlemagne. You know, they're, they're still capitalists. They just happen to also be called like, the Marquis of, you know, blah, blah, blah. So capitalist emerges in Europe largely because there's no political order that rules over this world commercial system, right? Whereas in China, there is an, empire, an imperial order that rules over that world economic system, right? what Wallerstein calls that world system. But what really is, is an interconnection of different hubs of commercial activity, right? And so there are inroads into that world system in China from largely the South China Sea, and there are egresses out of it. So trade flows in and trade flows out. But within China, you have this whole network of commercial activity that's going on between the urban centers and the rural spaces. And over that, you have this bureaucratic empire that rules over it. Europe doesn't have that. You go from, if you move, uh, say, commercially grown uh, wheat, that's, you know, or, or barley grown in Poland, and you transport it to France, 
you're going to cross maybe four different sovereign jurisdictions at least by the time you get there right you're going to cross through the territory of you know you know four or five different kings in other words or or queens or or sovereign um princes by the time you get to where you're going so you literally traverse through three or four different countries in other words by the time you get to where you're going but you're still part of the same economic uh network right so that lack of unity that lack of political empire as wallerstein says is the reason for the development of this unique system where the entire order of op the entire order of people's lives is ruled over by the heads of an economic order and they shape politics underneath them whereas in an imperial system it is the opposite the politicians are shaping the, the political leadership are shaping the uh, uh the economic system underneath them put overly simplistically but nevertheless india is india is interesting south asia in in other words is very interesting because south asia isn't politically unified for most of its history and so what is fascinating is we're seeing this like okay well it's not china with this overarching imperial system or the Ottoman Empire with this overarching, dominating imperial system. It looks kind of like Europe. So why not there? Well, let's jump in. Okay. So like our conversation on the, uh, the Chinese situation, the, oh, I apologize. I just flipped over to my other screen and I forgot to share my screen with you. Excuse me. There we are. So just like uh, when Milan starts talking about the Chinese, he starts talking about the native uh, or sorry, start, starts talking about the um, South Asian peoples going all the way back to the Middle Ages. Um, and he lays out first the argument for why capitalism didn't emerge natively within South Asia. And he says the traditional approach to this question was that, you know, South Asians were mostly involved in kind of luxury trade, right? Like this very kind of surface level, very much like the Malian Empire, right? Trading in in luxuries, trading in gold, you know, trade that doesn't affect regular people. It isn't going to turn over or, or upset or change anything that's going on at the level of the villages, right? That there are individuals engaged in trading these luxuries, but their impact on the political economy is small. That's the traditional view of South Asia, right? And he says... One of the reasons for this is the relative lack of South Asian sources on long distance trade between the 11th and the 15th century. But he says this isn't, you know, silence does not imply insignificance when we're looking at the historical record. You know, sometimes stuff gets lost. Sometimes people just don't see fit to save things. And just because we're not seeing written records doesn't mean it's not there. If we want to understand the importance of trade in India, one of the places we can look is in the sources that are their trading partners. In the East, looking at the Chinese sources that talk about the Indian trade, the goods that are coming into China from the Indian Ocean. And in the West, looking at the Arab sources that are talking about the trade that's going to and from the subcontinent, right? It says, that if we take these sources and look at them, to South, South Asia is, is shows an enormous expansion of commercial activity um, from the from the 11th to the 14th centuries. And he says this is makes sense. It wouldn't make sense for it not to. They're the midway point between 
the Arabs and the Chinese, who we know are doing a massive amount of business with each other. And the South Asian subcontinent is right smack dab in the middle of it. Geography matters, right? And so let's real quick, I want to jump over and take a look at the Indian Ocean, the South China Sea, and the uh, the Near East, so we can get a sense of what these relationships uh, look like geographically. And let's look around the time period we're talking about, the 15th century. So, oh, it's giving me 15th century maps of South Asia. Oh, here we go. Perfect. Indian Ocean Trade Networks. Wonderful. So here we have uh, what's called India here. Another word we use for it is South Asia. Um, let me explain the reason why there's some confusion about what we should call this place. India is an idea that's created by the British. Um, the idea of the subcontinent, this region uh, here, that the subcontinent should be a single unified political entity is really a product of uh, the, the, the British colonizing effort. They unified it politically. They dominated the people they turned it into a single administrative entity that they called India, okay? The word India or comes from Indies, which, may, which is a reference to basically stuff over there, right? And so when the British arrive in India and they start to transform it into a single uh, administrative colonial unit, when they conquer it, in other words, they call it one thing. South Asia of this period, right, this middle, this medieval period, all the way up really until the conquest of the British, is not politically unified. It is incredibly diverse. You have hundreds of different languages. You have hundreds of different ethnic groups. You have numerous different religions, right? And even uh, the ancient empires that sought to create unity in certain regions of the South Asian subcontinent, even they would maintain that diversity at the local level, at the local and regional level. So even, say, the Mughal Empire, which was the last great empire to conquer the South Asian subcontinent prior to the British, even when they conquered it, the Mughal Empire never sought to consolidate the languages, never sought to consolidate the, the religions never sought to kind of destroy the ethnic identities and force people into this idea of themselves as part of some kind of single unit. That, that, that not even, no one tried to do that prior to the British. And it's really modern capitalists that go, yeah, we don't care what language you speak. This is what you're going to start speaking now or you can't do business with us, right? Um, so this kind of diversity, um, political, ethnic, religious, um, this is something this is the this is the reality of india from the earliest days of human civilization and settlement all the way up until um britain and still to this day india is an incredibly ethnically religiously uh linguistically diverse place much less so than it was uh four or five hundred years ago but still so let's look at these indian trade networks these these south asian trade networks we have the arabic states uh, uh, the Arabic and Persian Muslim states uh, in the Near East, um, trade coming out of Egypt, trade coming out of the Persian Gulf, trade coming up uh, from from uh, East Africa, from Mozambique, Tanzania, um, all the way up through the Horn of Africa, um, Ethiopian trade networks coming across, you know, the Ethiopia rather being the stopover point, 
for the West African trade networks. Remember we talked about the West African trade networks when we talked about the Mali Empire? Those West African trade networks are coming east, right under the Sahel, right to the Horn of Africa, and they get hooked into this network in the Indian Ocean. Over in the east, we have the Chinese network, right? That the Chinese are hegemonically controlling, stretching from China all the way down into Southeast Asia. Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Burma, like all of these South Asian states, Indonesia, Borneo, um, these, you know, there's no Indonesia, rather, I should say, Borneo, Java, uh, Sumatra, like these different island states. The Philippines uh, are involved, the different Filipino uh, uh, Tagalog uh, um, um, kingdoms are, in, are hooked into these networks. The Japanese are hooked in to these different trade networks. The Koreans are hooked in to these different trade networks that the Chinese kind of rule over. Um, so even the people that are outside of China proper are still underneath this kind of larger sense of greater Chinese uh, economic um, control. So you have this massive trade network in the South China Sea which is far more complicated and much larger than they, than this map gives a credit for. You have these the the tail ends of the Near East and African trade networks, um, which are which are you know coming to their point in the cities along the east coast of Africa, um, and and in Egypt and you know along the Persian Gulf, and they're both interconnecting on either side of the subcontinent. So there's quite a bit of trade that's going back and forth. So the question becomes, and Melance kind of goes into a deep dive, looking at what kind of trade uh, this is. One of the things that is happening is a lot of bulk commodities, like just necessities. So you have things like leather, timber, metal goods, rice, textiles. The, the, the South Asian textile industry is absolutely massive. Um, they make some of the best textiles in the world as a result of this commerce because people all over the place want to get a hold of Indian textiles, like muslin, for example. Um, the Chinese have their own uh, uh, specialty with silk, and the West Africans do their own styles of textiles, uh, which are popular. But the Indians are at the center of that, and they begin producing textiles specifically for exportation. They're also producing quite a bit of uh, leather goods, and they produce specialty metal goods. The uh, Indian um, blacksmiths are quite good, and they produce really high-quality metal goods. Um, so there's a lot of bulk. There's a lot of food. There's also luxuries moving back and forth, back and forth. Um, you have Arabian horses that are being brought down, sold in India, purchased by the Chinese and shipped over to China, right? Or by Javanese traders or by Filipino traders or by even Japanese merchants, right? So you have Arabian horses ending up in Japan having been sold by a South Asian merchant. So you have large concerns of traders who are the middlemen between the Eastern and Western points, terminus points of these two massive trade networks. That's a recipe for making an absolutely gobsmacking amount of money. If I'm the person that's in the middle between an Arabian horse breeder and a Japanese uh, imperial court official that really wants one of the best types of horses in the world, I can make an absolutely gobsmacking amount of money. Okay, just to give one example. So being the middlemen, the question is, why isn't capital accumulating to the point where these South Asian bourgeoisie, these South Asian capitalists, are become powerful enough to begin to shape the local states to their will. Let's get into it.
So we start to see certain developments would look like this might happen, right? One of those things is in the 11th and 12th century, we see that forced labor begins to decrease, right? So you begin to see the development of a wage earning working class. This is very important. Wage earning working class. Capitalism depends upon people having access to money because if you don't have money, you can't buy things. So slavery is fine if it's happening out in the periphery where the commodities are being produced. But if you have slavery at home, it's a problem because it means your workers don't have cash and they can't pay for things. And it means you can't get access to their surplus value. It, that surplus value gets locked up and then it can't be utilized for profit. So I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. England is 100% cool with slavery that's you know, going on in Barbados and Jamaica. Why? Because the slavery that's going on in Barbados and Jamaica in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century is a slavery that they are using to grow sugarcane, primarily, also tobacco. Well, and that's sugarcane. And when that tobacco comes home to England, they are sold in the retail market to every level of English society, including, and this is very important, the working class. Now, if you have slavery in England and that working class is owned, they're not making wages, they're property, who's going to buy your sugar? All you have is the middle class and the capitalists. That's it. Your customer base just went from 99% of the population to 2% of the population like that. The money is in the volume. You want to be able to produce product that can be purchased in small increments by as many people as possible. That's where the money comes from. Okay? We're going to get into that. We'll, we'll get into more about why that is in a, in a little bit. But suffice to say, it's better to sell, uh, you know, it's better to sell sugar that costs a dollar to a thousand people than sell sugar that costs a hundred dollars to one person. So watching the decline of forced labor, watching the decline of um, peasant or, or, or in serfdom or enslavement decline in South Asia, that's an indication that capitalism might be starting to emerge. It's one of those kind of early signs, right? You also see the sophistication of credit and banking increase. That's another sign that you're about to see the emergence of capitalism. Um, you're seeing the expansion of the economy into the hinterlands, taking up more and more people into it. So people no longer are producing for their local needs, they're producing for the marketplace in increasing numbers throughout the South Asian subcontinent. Right. In addition, he says, fertile tracts and rich handicrafts, the areas of Gujarat and Bengal carried on a brisk overseas trade. Right. You have these connections with foreigners that are that are grounded in these major uh, and, and important regions of the subcontinent. So, you know, important interconnections between regions, right, that are long lasting and stable. That's another indication you're looking at maybe capitalism. Is going to uh, uh, is going to uh, emerge. He says, "Well, one of the you know you've got one of the explanations for why capitalism doesn't develop, in addition to like this completely wrong nonsense uh, thesis that oh, this is all luxury trade and it doesn't actually impact regular people. It's not subsuming the population into market based transactions." The second part, he says, the other explanation is they talk about the invasion of the Mongols, or who are known in South Asia as the Mughals. Same people, Mongol, Mughal. It's just a different pronunciation of the same term. The invasion of the Mughals and the establishment of the Mughal Empire. A lot of people say, well, that really you know, caused a big disruption in the economy and destroyed a lot of cities and you know, messed up a lot of things. He says, 
Well, yeah, there was a couple of a few cities in the Northwest where, that were at the kind of the the crux of the resistance to the early Mughal invasion, for sure. But he says, for the rest of the time period when the Mughals are in charge, you have a widespread use of really complicated instruments of finance, namely something called the Bill of Exchange, which that's a vocab word. We're, we're going to define that more as we go along. But basically, a bill of exchange is a way for me to take a physical object, turn it into a abstract value that I get to hold in my hand that I can then turn into another completely different physical object. Basically, it's currency. So I have a bill of exchange. I sell you a cow. Right. You give me a bill of exchange that has that value. I go to this other person and I say, I have this bill of exchange. I want to buy, um, I don't know, sheep. I can buy sheep with it. He had, uh, has that. He can then transfer that to someone else. These bills of exchange allow you to basically transform what would otherwise have to be barter exchanges of good for good with a currency exchange of a good or a service for a promissory note, effectively, right? So that that loosens up economic activity. Now, you're only going to conduct those kinds of exchanges with people that you deeply trust, people that you have long-term relationships with, but it does facilitate a lot of movement of goods back and forth um, without actually having to have the goods on hand at the time. So I purchase the cow, I write the bill of exchange, give it to the guy, take my cow, he goes and uses that to buy sheep. That guy who just he who sold the sheep comes back to me and says, I'm turning this in for X number of cows, right? Which is now discounted. And I say, okay, here you go. That's my bill of exchange, here are your cows, right? So it allows you to move money and commerce around uh, in a much easier fashion. And again, you see, because of that, the development of this commerce in textiles, wine, paper, sugars, um, Egyptian silk, right? Chinese silk, cotton. Cotton is really big, right? If you live in a warm climate, you don't want to be wearing wool. Cotton is king. Silk's too expensive for everybody to use. Cotton is the textile par excellence of the uh, Ecuadorian, like the, the regions around the equator. You have Bengali ships going to China, ser serving as a link between the Chinese and uh, uh, the Pacific, right? So with all of this development, with all of this considerable wealth being accumulated, why not South Asia, right? Talking about colonial, he says, look, we're going to look at colonialism. Colonialism only happens way, way, way later on. And, it, you know, colonialism as an important factor only occurs until way, way later on. I mean, shit, when the Portuguese show up, they show up with like four ships and are a pain in the ass in like one region. Also, Portuguese piracy in that in that region pales in comparison to the native-born piratical activities. I mean, oh my God, are you kidding me? Malaysian pirates are a, the bane of uh, merchants' existence in that region for centuries. Um, so the so the introduction of the Europeans into that region initially is not super. Um, disruptive to the to the trade networks right so he goes into the attempt to the portuguese attempt to disrupt the spice trade from the levant and from he says quote from the european point of view the most profitable commodity which have been controlled by muslim traders for several centuries but most of their efforts failed to achieve their ambitious aims authors uh, have pointed to the fundamental changes brought about by the intrusion of European charter companies like the Vrinki Austin, uh, oh, I'm not going to try to pronounce uh, 
the Dutch, basically the Dutch East India Company, into the Asian trade networks and their success at establishing monopolistic control over commercial routes in the 17th century. Yes, they have monopolistic control over over uh, uh, trade networks, but only the trade networks that are going all the way back to Europe. So if we look back at our map of the of the um, trade networks, the Europeans would control the trade network that went from India back around the Horn of Africa, uh, back around the Cape of Good Hope, rather, back up to Europe, right? So the trade network that goes in and out, yes, absolutely Europeans monopolistically control that. You have no Indian ships, no South Asian, no Arabian, no Chinese junks sailing south of Africa and sailing up towards Europe. That is absolutely correct. They're not monopolistically controlling the rest of this trade network. That's insane. There's no way they could they could establish that kind of control in the 15th and 16th, or sorry, in the uh, 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, right? They don't have that kind of juice yet. It's not really until the 18th century that you start to see the development of a coherent and and abjectly controlled South Asia by a European power, um, and only really until the end of the 18th century by the British. So in the period that we're talking about, the European intrusion into the Indian Ocean at the end of the 15th century, it has an effect. But it's not this like enormously like destructive or disruptive effect that's suggested by some of the authors. So he goes on, he says, although more European merchants than previously recognized were able to penetrate the Eastern markets, they were faced with powerful Asian states on the mainland. The freedom of action was extremely limited, meaning they had to follow the rules like everybody else. If you show up with a whole fleet, as the Portuguese first did, you could act like a jerk for a while. But if you're an individual Portuguese, Dutch, later on French and English trader, you have to act appropriately, right? But until you own that space, you can't just walk around like you own the place and blow people out of the water, but cut your head off, right? So the fact is, right up until the late 18th century, European powers were able to establish more direct colonial rule on the ground and affect production quotas. 80% of the cargoes originating from Western Europe contain mostly silver and gold, meaning Europeans are not trading with goods they're producing at home. They're trading for with currency. They are showing up as a customer to buy goods made in China, made in India, made in East Africa, and they are bringing it home to Europe to sell for a higher price. They are the only product of exchange that Europeans have that anyone in the Indian Ocean or the Chinese uh, South China Sea wants is money, silver and gold coins. That's it. There's nothing Europeans produce that anyone in this region gives two craps about because European produced goods are garbage. They are horrible in comparison to the goods that are made in this space. Why? Well, for most of European history, you didn't have a ton of movement of commerce back and forth. The emergence of a commercial world system, as Wallerstein instructs us, is relatively recently. And so there isn't a lot of trade in textiles. There isn't a lot of trade in ceramics. There isn't a lot of trade in metalwork within the European continent really until the 15th century, really until the 14th century, right? Whereas the Chinese the and the South Asians, they've been doing it since the, the 8th century, right? Or the 7th century, sometimes longer, right? That's another reason why we talk about Chinese and South Asian merchants going all the way back, because it helps us explain why they're so much more advanced than the Europeans in all of these crafts. So the settlement of European colonial powers on diverse islands and archipelagos across the Indi or Indian Ocean littoral zone was not, was not coincidental. It was a logical copy of the colonization of the Bene Byzantine emperor's insular possessions, right? You go and set up on an island because it gives you a stopover point before you get, you know, between you and where you're buying your goods. 
ships are fragile. Ships are prone to damage and sinking. If you're going to go to India, you're going to want to have at least two or three places where if you need to, you can pull over and you can fix sails. You can patch a hull. Sometimes just a port in a storm if you run into a hurricane or a typhoon, right? Having those stopover points on the way to India, it's part of that process. It doesn't re represent, in other words, some kind of like massive sheet sea change or shift in the way that things are, uh, in the way that business is being done, right? He says, it is impossible to, to compare the amount of overland trade during this period with the amount of commodities exchanged by sea. But since transportation over water is much cheaper, most commodities, especially bulk goods, were probably transported by ship. There's probably some truth to the statement, whoever controlled the sea controls most of the trade. Nevertheless, the impact of overland trade in certain areas should not be underestimated. It would be a gross exaggeration to claim that in Asia, already before 1400 long distance trade, went into our entirely maritime. That's impossible. Let's go back to the map. If you're in India, there's a ton of Indian landowners that live in the interior of India who have a hell of a lot of money. They're producing a hell of a lot of surplus from their farms, from the land under their control. It is going to behoove you to move those goods inland, usually along river systems, and sell product to them. Now, is it going to be more expensive in the interior? Certainly. Is it going to be is it going to take longer to get there? Absolutely. But it's still profitable. China's the same way on an even grander scale. Look at how much land there is away from the coast. It's not like these people in the interior are bumpkins. They're producing surplus value. They would like to get their hands on some of these imported products. And if you can move them down the river systems, you can make them available to them, right? The Yangtze and the Yalu, you move those products down those river systems and you can get um, you can get access to that value that's being produced in those interior regions. Once again, is it more expensive than if you were buying it on the coast? Certainly. But nevertheless, still profitable. So what is the point of this? He sees, it says, it seems equally doubtful to claim that Europeans had already obtained a, quote, dominant share of inter-Asian trade by the early 17th century. They don't have enough people on the ground. There aren't enough Europeans operating in the Indian Ocean for that to happen, right? The European share in Asiatic trade was probably only minor up until the 18th century, as I said. This limited trade was primarily due to Europeans' inability to effectively dominate all major maritime trade routes, let alone, let alone any of the land routes. In order to dominate a maritime route of trade, you have to take over a city. You have to take over the commercial port that is the center of that trade. Europeans don't start taking over Indian ports until the 18th century. There's a couple of exceptions. The Portuguese have a trading entrepot in Goa that goes back to the 17th century. But most of India is absol absolutely independent of European control until the late 18th century, when the British start to gobble up all of, first and foremost, all of those commercial hubs along the Indian subcontinent uh, coast. So these are all the reasons why. It's not internal poverty. It's not um, external forces that are that are scooping up the capital before the uh, Indi for the so South Asian people can utilize it. Milan says it's a it has to do with the structure of their societies, the way that they structure, the exploitation of workers at the from the base level of society all the way up to the nobility. And he says, starts talking about the traditional Marxist model associated with what's known as the Asiatic mode of production. The Asiatic mode of production was specifically to talk about this problem. 
because even Marx, going all the way back to the 1850s, recognized, oh shit, how do we explain India? Right? It's wealthier than almost any place in the world, with the exception of China. It's commercially more advanced than literally anywhere else in the world. Why isn't capitalism emerging there? And Marx's explanation was something called the Asiatic mode of production. Right? He says, look, when you're looking at the Asiatic system, you're not looking at the kind of um, intense exploitation that you see in Europe. India is too diverse. It's got too large a population for nobles to be able to effectively control people at that level. So what you end up having is essentially a protection racket. You have local warlords who essentially show up once a year, collect a tribute from a region, from a from a village, and that's essentially paying them off to go away. And this becomes the model for how um, how tribute taxes are collected, going all the way through the Mughal Empire, even into the early British imperial rule in India. Right? You're not seeing a you know constant locally um locally sourced form of like deep penetrative exploitation you don't have peasants living at the feet of a manor house cut you know constantly being worked by a lord that can look out and watch them and threaten them the asiatic mode of production or what's known as the tributary mode of production the exploitation is there for sure, but it's lighter, it's less frequent, and it's under far less levels of surveillance, meaning you can lie more easily to the warlord when he comes around to collect his tribute. Oh, we had a tough year. Hail. Uh, and then you can maybe pass off less than he claims he's owned, right? And so for Marx, that's the reason. You don't have the gathering of those. You don't have the accumulation. Here's another word that's, here's another vocab term. You don't have the primitive accumulation necessary to develop those pools of revenue, those pools of capital that would allow you to begin starting the engine of a capitalist economy. In Europe, where the peasantry is much more immiserated, much more heavily exploited, those kinds of pools of capital exist because so much of the production of the peasantry is being subsumed by that those classes of landowners. So it's very easy to get a hold of that capital, very easy to get a hold of that surplus value and utilize it for um, investment. He says that's not, you know, Marx's explanation is that's not really happening in India. Um, sociologists tend to focus on the caste system. I don't find that to be very convincing. Um, the caste system, for those of you that don't know, is how Indian society separated itself. It's kind of like a class system, but a class system on steroids, right? So if you're born into a caste in pre-modern India that is specifically involved in the preparation of dead bodies for burial, that's what you do. You cannot leave that caste, right? If you're uh, born into the caste of people who tr or who act as merchants, that's what you do. You cannot leave that caste. And sociologists often make a point of like, well, this kind of rigidity really prevented the merchant class from becoming dominant. Here's what I know about culture. It always, I repeat, it always bows to economic and political power. If the merchant caste had become powerful enough, had acquired enough capital to overbear the warrior slash kingship caste and the Brahmin, the kind of holy, the, 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 the holy men caste, if that had been possible, they would have done so. 
and no understanding of place, no understanding of identity is going to stand in the way. Culture bows to economic power in every single historical example. Right? So the sociological explanation of caste is absolutely, um, I don't believe, uh, convincing. Um, so what I'm going to ask you guys to look at on your own, and I'll come back with a later video to kind of talk about this. Answer this question for me as we end our unit. If it's none of those things, according to Melance, what is the reason? I look forward to hearing uh, what some of your what some of your answers are uh, in this week, and I look forward to um, talking to you later. We're at about forty five minutes, so I'm going to let you guys go. I hope you're well and have a wonderful rest of your week. Bye, guys.